even if I still had the accounting on my choices. So it should be the same way. I won't. You think so? Mm -hmm. Oh, I will start this. Okay. Sociology, major in paper one, mm -hmm. paper two. Okay. Source A. Then we. Diane Ray and her colleagues wanted to study people going to university in the UK who were not from, from traditional middle class backgrounds. But the searchers studied people from six different universities and their sample population. They gave out 502 questionnaires and followed this up with 53 interviews with students. The qualitative interviews were thought not to be representative of the whole sample population. So if it is not representative of the whole sample gen uh, population, it means it cannot be generalized. That is what not representing the whole population needs. But if it represents, if a sample can represent the whole of the population, we call it generalization. Mm -hmm. Just put that in mind. So the go students on. were given a free choice to define their own ethnicity. Ethnicity. And... The result was not as the researchers expected. In the UK, the majority of the people are white, but less than half of the sample divide their ethnicity this way. Mm -hmm. One interviewee, that is the person interviewed, defined himself by his nationality rather than by his ethnicity. Mm -hmm. You see, it doesn't talk about his ethnicity, what I talked about his nationality. That means he said, Oh, I'm from I'm a British. Mm -hmm. It doesn't talk about, oh, I'm an Indian from this, but I'm a British. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the first question says, using source A, this source, identify two research methods used by the researchers. So based on this, when you check through the second paragraph, they said gave out they gave out 502 questionnaires. So questionnaire was used as a research. And through the last one, they said the interviewee divined himself by his nature, by his nationality. That means interview was used. So the two research methods used according to the source is our questionnaires and interview. Mm -hmm. I think that is clear. Yeah. We go to question two. B, sorry. Identify two methods that might be used to research or go to university apart from those in source. As, aside from questionnaire and interviews, we can use observation, we can use content analysis. Mm -hmm. These are also different types of research methodology. Uh, C, using source A, describe two problems with their researchers' methods. Yeah, based on this method, uh, the first problem that the researcher might have, we call it researcher's bias. Mm -hmm. So, as an interviewer, your status your status might determine what questions you ask mm -hmm. from your interviewee. Mm -hmm. So there might be researchers biasness. Do you get what the yeah. point is here? So here I said the two problems about the researcher are as follows one. The, I thought, let's quickly talk about the bias here. Bias means you are not being objective. That is what bias means. You are not objective. You are influenced with maybe your social status. You are influenced because of your class. You are influenced because of the peer you belong. Mm -hmm. or the group you belong. Mm -hmm. So that might make your interviewee feel not comfortable. Or you might not feel comfortable with your interviewee because he, is, he or she is not in the same class as you have. Mm -hmm. He or she is not in the same group as you have. He or she is not in the same, it doesn't have the same religion practice as you have. Mm -hmm. So that might bring God by hazardness. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, look at what the interviewee used there. He talked, he or she talked, she talked about, I think he or she, the interviewee, well, he or she talked about his or her nationality instead of her ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So some people might not feel comfortable because the research is based on ethnicity, social class, mm -hmm. and peer. Yeah. So the, uh, the interviewee might not feel, the respondent or the participant or the interviewee might not feel comfortable stating his ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Rather, we talk about his nationality. Do you understand? Yeah. So I might be a Nigerian, but I have a British passport. So I might, feel not, I might not feel comfortable saying that I'm from Nigeria. Rather, I'm say I'm, from, I'm a British. Yeah. So that could make, that could be the problem the researcher might face. Biasness. That means even the interviewee, that's the researcher, the interviewer, that's the researcher, might not feel comfortable with the interviewee. Mm -hmm. The second one is about you not feeling comfortable as a respondent or participant, not feeling comfortable to say much about your class, much about your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Yeah. So the third one. Um, D. Describe the reasons why research may be conducted covertly. When you talk about covert system, covert system means you are taking you are making a research secretly. Mm -hmm. the, you, are, you are not known that you are researching on some participants. So the participant doesn't know your involvement. 
that or the participant doesn't know that you are carrying up out a research on them. Okay. That is covert. Okay. We have the covert and the overt. Overt means it is known to the participants that you are researching on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the reasons why we use covert system is the Oton effect. What is Oton effect? So Oton effect means that the presence of the interviewer or the presence of the researcher change your way. Just like in the classroom, mm -hmm. you, you heard that, oh, an, an inspector is coming to your class. So you're going to change your mood, your model of sitting, your method of communicating. You have to sit properly because you know someone is coming. That is overt. Mm -hmm. But here, covert is used so that the behavior of the participant comes naturally. Do you get the point here? So yeah, it's an auto effect whereby the presence of the researcher might influence the behavior of the group. Mm -hmm. Do you get the point? Yeah. So because you know that you are being researched on, you you don't behave your natural way. Yeah. Do you get that? Yeah. And because you are not behaving naturally, that might invalidate the research. That might make the research not valid. Yeah. Do you get it? Because the research is based on your behavior, but now you are formed your behavior. Mm -hmm. It's not not it's not you anymore. That's not you. That's open yes. effect. Yeah. The second one, it tells the researcher to gain access to the actual motives and behavior of the group. Mm -hmm. Do you get my point? So you wouldn't know I'm I'm seated in your class. You see, you think I'm a student like you. Mm -hmm. So and I'm a researcher. I'll be able to know how you deal amongst each other because you're going to deal with me that way too. So I'll be able to have access to your attitude. I'll have, I'll have access to your attitude. I'll have access to your behavior because you're going to deal with me like every other student do. So that's why sometimes researchers will use covert system. Okay. Is it clear? Yeah, okay. F? E. E. Describe two strengths and two limitations of using self -conflict. completion questionnaires. questionnaires. When we talk about self completion questionnaires, these are, they are, these are questionnaires that are carried out mm -hmm. individually without the help of the interviewer. Okay. So you just get, you have it, you have to answer all the questions all about, all yourself. You don't have, you don't get any help mm -hmm. from the interviewer or the researcher. So what are the strengths of using self-completed or self-completion questionnaire? Number one, I said it could reach large geographical area because the questionnaire. So you just have to post it to as much as different location. Mm -hmm. So that means it could reach a large geographical area, which is good for you because at least you'll be able to get information from different locality. Yeah. Two, so, it is cheap as it does not involve you paying for researchers. So you just have to feel, uh, the researcher doesn't need to pay maybe transportational cost or whatever cost. It doesn't, he or she is not gonna incur any cost because as soon as you have the post, as soon as you get the post, you feel it and you return. So you you send back. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't involve so much cost. So it's cheap. The problems about using self-completion questionnaire, number one, respondents might not give valid answers. You might you might have a questionnaire now, but in the course of you answering them, you might not give the you might not give the right answers. Mm -hmm. you, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? Questionnaire is questions that comes to you about certain topic yeah. that you have to say yes or no. They are open-ended, you understand? Mm -hmm. So if you get the questionnaire, because you, you don't have the interviewer with you or the researcher with you, you are only to fill it and submit. Mm -hmm. So you might not fill it well. Oh, okay. Why? Maybe even, like it might be your present way. situation. You might not feel happy at that point in time. Yeah. So your present situation might make you not answer the questions well. And that stops, that, that takes away the validity. Two, you might be so busy that you just throw it somewhere that it's not even going to check it. Yeah. So okay. that's the point there. Is it clear? Okay. It, that's, it might not be returned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Explain why sociologists may use triangulation in their research. Triangulation. So when you talk about triangulation, it means you are using two or more methods for, a, for the same research topic. Two or more method for the same research topic. Oh, the research is about why are the students in why are the girls in Mukhtar doing better than boys in Mukhtar? So I could use interview, I could use questionnaire, I could use different methods. I could use 
participant observation, I could use content analysis. So instead of me to use one method, I'm going to use questionnaire, I'm going to use interview, I'm going to use participant observation. I'm using three methods of research here for the same topic. That is what we call triangulation. Is it clear? So that's about that. So why is triangulation, why is it used by sociologists? Yeah, I said, one, uh, sociologists use triangulation because one, it makes research to be more generalized. Mm, yeah. yeah, because it has credibility and it can be repeated. More so, specific. Yeah, it's more specific. Thank you. So it, you can repeat it and say, okay, yeah, at least talking to two or three boys, talking to four or five girls in the same school, in the same class, mm -hmm. means the old girls I've talked to, means the old boys I have talked to. Yeah. Two, so it brings credibility to research as using one method may lead to drawbacks. So if I used questionnaire alone, I won't be able to have accessibility to using other research methods. That means there might be limitation. But if I use all the methods and it's giving me the same result, then the research is valid and credible. Do you get it? Yeah. The third one. Uh, so what no. There are 10 marks here. Ah, oh, you need 3.5. Okay. okay. Yeah, the, uh, the third one. Uh, the fourth one, I said, it allows researchers to support qualitative with quantitative data. What is qualitative research? Qualitative research is based on historical documents, based on real life. That is qualitative. Quantitative is based on data response, statistics. So now with triangulation, using questionnaire and interview, questionnaire is qualitative. Interview is also qualitative. You can still talk about participant observation, sample, using sample, statistics, survey. Mm -hmm. So when you use survey, that is quantitative. So using survey as a research, comparing it with questionnaire, or interview, which is qualitative, you get the same information and it's fine. Mm -hmm. So that means you can compare qualitative research, a qualitative data with quantitative data because you are using triangulation. Yeah. Do you get it? And the last one, several methods being about accessibility to more studies. So because you are using different methods, it makes you to know more. So, oh, now I know I can use, now I can use uh, participant observation. Yes, I can use uh, questionnaire, yes, I can use interview. So I know more about different research methods. Yeah. That's allowed, if you're using triangulation, that's an, uh, that's an advantage. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Very clear. Do now we go to G. To what extent was it possible to generalize from research? So we go to generalization. I told you earlier, I said generalization means what? In general. Research, so making a sample, mm -hmm. making a sample research and using it for the whole population. So the research is for a sample, but you are you use it cut across the whole population. That is generalization. I think the point is clear. Mm -hmm. Great. So here I said, now for generaliz generalization, we have what we call positivists. They are, they are sociologists too, but they believe in the scientific approach. So they believe that whatever, they believe in quantitative data. So that's scientific approach. They believe in laboratory, they believe in Using uh, 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 using uh, laboratory and using quantitative information for research for human, so we call them uh, we call them positivist. Okay, so for positivists, they said I wrote here. They said positive belief generalization brings about quantitative research, which means it brings about better representation. For positivists, they believe human can you can get more about human when you take them to the lab. That is their own ideology. So they believe in data. They believe in statistics. Mm -hmm. As a result, it is backed up using generalization. They believe when you use quantitative research, you can use it to represent a lot of, uh, you can use it to represent the whole population mm -hmm. by generalizing. Mm -hmm. Because when you represent, it means when you represent a sample with the whole gen, when you represent a sample for a whole survey or for a whole population, it means you are generalizing. Mm -hmm. So this type of, Gener generation is good for positivists as they use quantitative data to represent the whole generation. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, generalization is appropriate when the research is done within a small group. It makes it easier to represent. So when you're making research about a small group, mm -hmm. you can just choose two, three, four people and use it to represent the whole class. So it's easy. That's another way to use generalization. And three, I wrote positivists would argue that data are high in reliability 
data that uh, data that are high in reliability and repeatable are likely to be generalized. Data, the information we get, mm -hmm. if they are reliable, if we can repeat them, then we can generalize it. We got information about grade tens. Mm -hmm. So this same information we got from grade 10 is reliable. Why? Because there's no biasness and we have qualitative and quantitative data, maybe we've used triangulation. As a result, if we do it again after tomorrow, we're still going to get the same thing. That is reliability and repeatable. Mm -hmm. So if it is repeatable, then we can generalize it. Mm -hmm. This is according to positivist. But the opposite of positivist are the interpretivist. Mm -hmm. For the interpretivist, they believe mostly on qualitative data. And they believe human are not something that we take to the lab. So the behavior of human needs proper checking and uh, proper checking and close observation. So that's interpretivist. Mm -hmm. Do you get the point? Yeah. So based on what I wrote here, so I said uh, for positivist, uh, for interpret. Okay, now the lab. Okay, however, I said however there may be sampling error. So the first problem we have about generalization is that, you know, you are collecting data because it is quantitative. Positivists use quantitative data. So in the course of you collating data, you might make mistake. Yes or no? Yeah. And uh, when you make mistake, when you make mistake, that means you cannot generalize it. Did you get the point? Yeah, yeah. When you make mistake, you cannot generalize. So that's, uh, that's one of the problems about generalization. Two, for interpretivists, they believe that human are not need close observation. It's not something that you take to the market or to the lab to understand how they behave. Mm -hmm. Do you understand the point? So that is the second point about interpretivists. And the third, I said, if the data is inaccurate, it cannot be used elsewhere. So if the data we put together are inaccurate, that means they are not are not up to power, are not um, are not well represented. So it means you cannot use them again. It's it's not authentic. It's fake. Mm -hmm. It's full of errors. So that means you cannot generalize it. So we're talking about the problems using generalization. According to interpretivist, one, they said the sample might have an error. So if the sample has error, you cannot use it to generalize. Yeah. Two, human are not what you take to the lab to understand. Mm -hmm. So you need close understand. You need close observation for human. So this makes it not easy to use quantitative data, according to positivists. Yeah, yeah. Is it clear? Any question about that? No. So that's G. Question two. Um, what is this? Adolescence. Adolescence. Adolescence often feel peer pressure to fit in with their friends. This may lead to them changing their norms, values, and identity in order to be accepted by their peer group. A, what is meant by the term peer group? So we're talking about peer group. We're talking about your age, your age mates, mm. the people that you have. You are in the same class mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of group, in terms of office, in that you have the same age. Your mates. That's a peer group. Mm -hmm. I think it's clear. Yeah. The second question. Describe the examples of peer pressure. What is peer pressure? Peer pressure comes when you have to conform, conform to uh, to certain ways, certain identities, certain uh, certain values of your peer. Oh, this is what they do. You have to do the same way they do. That is what we call peer pressure. That means you are forced to do or to behave in certain way that might not be good for the society. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. get it? Yeah. So what are the examples of peer, uh, peer pressure? Number one, bullying. Yeah. So bullying peers. Yeah, with bullying, bullying peers to conform to the ways and behavior of certain group. You might get bullied because they want you to behave their way. Mm -hmm. Do you get the point? They are your group. They are your mates, but you're not doing what they do. They can bully you so that you, you become, you, you conform to their ways. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, uh, rejection by peers. They might start rejecting you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to go to the uh, to the cafeteria. They say, no, you can't come in now. They stop you from coming. They gossip about you. Mm -hmm. So 
they try to do things that makes you to feel uncomfortable being alone. So these are peer pressure. Mm -hmm. So you be, so that you can be part of them. Mm -hmm. They explain how children learn social conformity. conformity. Social conformity means society ways, accepted ways of behavior. Mm -hmm. That social conformity. Mm -hmm. I think it's clear. So for children, I yeah, I, was, I said children can learn social conformity through the following ways. Number one, negative sanction. You know, they are acceptable behavior in the society. These things you must not do as a child. So if you get, if you do it, this is the uh, this is the penalty for doing it. So they can sanction you negatively. They might put you aside. You might not be allowed to go out with friends. Mm -hmm. These are ways in which parents try to conform or the society conform children. Do you get the point here? Negative sanction. So negative sanction means they, they penalize you negatively, like, oh, you won't be given certain things. You won't have access to some things. You might be put aside. Another way to, to make conformity is through rewards for those that conform. Mm -hmm. So because you are doing the right thing in the society, because as a child, you are doing what you are supposed to do. We we'll give you sweets. We we'll give you chocolates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? That's, that's another way of bringing up conformity in the society. What do I write again? Yeah, the third I said, children can learn conformity through religion. Yeah, through religious teaching. Mm -hmm. You can also learn conformity. Maybe. Yes or no? Good. Then we'll go to the... Explain why belonging to a youth subculture may have a negative impact on the individual. We're talking about subculture means culture within a culture. Subculture means what? Culture within a culture. That There's the Libyan culture. Then we have the Amazi. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So that's what we call subculture. Do you get the point here? Yeah, yeah. So for youth subculture, I was, I said youth subculture, this implies the youth having their own norms and values aside to those of the society. So the youth, they have their own norms, they have their own values aside the society's values, mm -hmm. aside the society culture. So what are examples of youth subculture? Number one, anti-school subculture. Okay. Against school. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? They might form a subculture to reject certain school practices. So coming late to school, not listening to teachers, not doing the right thing at the right time, not putting on uniform. These are anti-school subculture. Yeah. Do you understand? So yes, yeah, said subculture could have a negative impact on individual. So the question is about how subculture could have a negative impact mm -hmm. on individual. And the first one I'm talking about now is anti-school subculture. This could come when your mates, they, they don't wear uniform to school, they don't listen to teachers. They whatever they do everything against the school, normal school practices. And this could be as a result of them forming a group. They form the group so that they can go against the school. Mm -hmm. So because as soon as they have a group, they, they have a subculture that could counter the school practices. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, drug taking. I wrote some youths might follow their role models. They might have, you know, because there's a, they formed the gang already. They have this youth subculture. So in that, in that subculture, you might have your, if, in as much as you are there, it means you have a role model. If your role model is drilling in drug, then you might be forced to do it too. And is that good for the society? No, that's the point there. Do you get the point? The third one, deviance. Not listening, doing things, Doing the, doing the opposite of what the society wants. So for Debian, I wrote, some youths might start violating social rules and conventions due to subculture. So you are part of the society. You are part of, you, you are, because you have a subculture, this allows you to start misbehaving in the society. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Is it clear? And the last one, crime. Because there's a subculture, there's a gang. Mm -hmm. You might start going on with social vices, things that are that are not good for the society, that are ill to the society. Mm -hmm. Because you have there's a subculture. You know, a subculture is just like an institution too. But what does it do? It's against the society. That's what the point is talking about here. Mm -hmm. Because it's against the society, it could be a shield for you that you have certain behavior 
that is that nobody is accepting. So that place becomes your Eden place that will accept all your social, all your bad attitude. Mm -hmm. That is subculture. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. The last one, right? Yeah. E. E. To what extent is the peer group the most important an agency of socialization? So when you talk about socialization, so what socialization is the process of of internalizing and um, internalizing the norms and the values of the society. Mm -hmm. It means you are teaching people how to behave in the society. Mm -hmm. That is what socialization is. Mm -hmm. So the question is about how peer group, to what extent is peer group an important agency of socialization? We have different agencies of socialization. We have the family, we have the school, we have the peer group. They are all agents of socialization. Do you get the point? So for the peer group, the first thing I would say, the peer group is one of the most important agencies of socialization due to the following reasons. Number one, peer group influences the friendship network and connection which is important to the society. Peer group can be part of the agency of, agency of socialization because with peer group, that means you have the link, connection that could bring you up in the society. Mm -hmm. Do you get the point? Yeah. So anti-school culture shows that despite, yes, now let's go back to anti-school. Anti-school subculture is as a result of the peers coming together to form a gang, right? How are they able to do this? Because they have peers, yes or no? So despite efforts of school, the parents, the teachers, still they're still anti-school subculture. So that means the peer group is important in the society. Do you get the point? The third one, peer group often initiate the image and identity of individuals. Peer group, they influence what you do. They give you a name because identity means a name, your personality. They, they give you an image that portrays that culture. Mm -hmm. Do you understand the importance of peer group as an agency of socialization here? But according to functionalists, for functionalists, who are functionalists? These are sociologists that believe that if things are put in order, there won't be social vices. We call them functionalists. So they believe in function. They believe that things should be placed in order. Do you get the point? So, however, number one, functionalists argue that the nuclear family is the most important agency of socialization. For functionalists, they don't believe that the uh, the first agency of socialization is and uh, is peer group because they feel everything comes from home, the family, the, especially the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. Do you get the first point? I'm talking about the argument against peer group being the most important agency of agency of socialization. Mm -hmm. Do you get the point? Do you get the point or not? I do. Okay, the second one. Family socializes children to, to know about their identity, how they have to behave. Mm -hmm. So it's the family, according to functionalists. Mm -hmm. And the last one. Family is more important because it gives the core skills such as speaking, walking, and toileting to the family, uh, to the child, not the peer. So do you understand what we're talking about here? We're talking about the significance of family and peer group as an agency of socialization yeah and end, end question no okay yes yeah. yeah.